this morning. Come on, we're gonna sing about the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus.
God, thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you so much that we can sing out to you praises for all the things that you've done. God, thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your son to die for us while we were still sinners. That is such a love that we can never fully understand. And God, thank you so much for the gift of baptism that we can join in you, join with you in you raising us just as you raised your son. God, thank you that you nailed our sins to the cross. You canceled the debt of our sin. Thank you so much. God, I ask in this moment that you would just let us feel the weight of that sacrifice just a bit more. Thank you. We continue to sing out worship and praise to you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.
Amen, amen, amen. Are we not grateful that we have an Emmanuel who has come for us? God with us. Oh, praise God. Hey, let me pray for us. Father, we thank you so much that you would give your one and only son, that he would be called Emmanuel, God with us. Not simply God for us, not simply God beside us, God with us. Oh, we receive all of your love, all of your grace. As children receive a father's love this morning, we thank you, Jesus, for choosing to be God with us in this season, in this life, and forevermore. In your mighty name, amen. Hey, you may be seated for a moment. One of the things that we wanted to highlight kind of as we are halfway through our joyful giving season is the other 90% of joyful giving, right? So we're going to throw up a slide here just as a bit of information for us all. So 10% of all of our joyful giving is going to go to this Kingdom Impact Fund, which you've heard much about, that we're partnering with local churches on mission for the gospel, Bible-believing to see more disciples made than we could do on our own. But what happens to the 90%, right? We rarely ever talk about it. So this 90%, which is a, makes up a large portion of finances, is going to be going into the general fund. And the general fund is something that we operate out of 12 months a year. Know that this is, this is the place where we operate out of. I'll just say it that way. The general fund is what you see if you give online that we click to. It used to be called All In. This is the breakdown of what 2024's general fund is going to look like. And so, again, 10% is going to the Kingdom Impact Fund. 90% of all of Joyful Giving is going to the general fund. And the breakdown that we've operated out of in 2022, 2023, and into 2024 is consistent across the board. That 52% of all giving, all revenue, everything we have actually goes to operating, paying for, and servicing the Point Community Center. Many people think, well, this, this building just must pay for itself, right? How Your home must pay for itself, right? Your driveway must plow itself, right? And so for us, we sink so much into it because this is the asset that God has given us to reach Greater Portland. And it reaches hundreds of lives a week. It could be the sheriff's department using the back auditorium for training. It could be a mom with her three little kids coming in to get a little respite and use the playscape or the turf. It could be for case managers that are overseeing supervised visits with a mom who hasn't seen her kiddo in a long time. The Point Community Center is postured 52 weeks a year to reach Greater Portland. And so that's why over half of everything we have, it goes into it. Whether it's the mortgage, whether it's the utilities, the maintenance, the staffing, the programming, all of that is captured under that. And then further down is our adult discipleship. That's you. Ha ha. Right? <laughs> There's no... So 29 and a half, almost 30% is actually going into encouraging and equipping this body at large with programming and staffing and, and focused environments to help people in their journey with Jesus. And that 12% is vested in our entire family ministry. All that we pour into our kiddos, the curriculum, again, the staffing, the spaces, all of the crafts that you love taking home, parents, and putting on your fridge. You're welcome. I'm in that season too. I'm like, Hadley, you made all of this in 35 minutes? <laughs> but we invest in our families. And then also that over 6.5% actually goes to local and global outreach beyond anything we do here in the community center. That's our Easter offering. That's the Go Team. That's, that's internal benevolence to help support people here within the church family. That's uh, for team expansion as we partner with them across the globe and the work they're doing to reach unreached people groups. So just know as you're going into a season in, of planning, preparing, praying for what joyful giving might look like for you, this is the breakdown. We want to be completely transparent. We want people to understand this is where the finances go to be able to impact mission and vision here in Greater Portland. And overall, it's about a $4.2 million budget. So people walk in here and they look at the lights and they look at the turf and they go, these guys got all the money in the world. It's because people are really faithful to give. Right? And it's not that people are just giving to be able to keep the lights on and keep the turf clean. People are giving back to God through the local church so that we can continue impacting people in Jesus' name. 
right? The individual, the individual is so important, but imagine the collective. As we all lean in in this season, as we all lean into the year to come in 2024, we want to be postured well to come out of the gates into the first of the year, hungry for the presence of God and hungry to see thousands of Mainers come to know him. And so for us, that takes earthly financial tools like our gifts, that takes tangible resources given back so that we, we can steward them well. We can invite you in and we can think on behalf of this church family, how can we engage Greater Portland with the good news of the gospel more and more, day by day, week by week, month by month. And so this year, as you go into joyful giving or continue through this season, we're moving right towards December 31st is the last day for joyful giving. That Sunday, we'll be able to communicate and update a little bit where we are year to date, but know that we're not just thinking to the 31st. We're thinking in the first quarter, the second quarter, how we can engage Greater Portland in greater ways. So would love for you to partner with that. My wife and I are participating just as much as anybody, eager to see what God will do with our tithes and our offerings as we bring them back to him. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you so much for just how good you are to us, how your grace and your mercy have poured out like rivers upon us. And that your invitation with the tithe is just to return back to you what's rightfully yours. That these small acts of obedience that we see ultimately are multiplied, that turn into lives transformed. People declaring that Jesus is Lord, living lives in obedience and abundance because of what you've done in them. And so, Father, we, we take these gifts, we offer them to you prayerfully expectantly and eager to see how you'll invite us in the game as well with our hands and feet. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So a couple, couple things today. Logistically, I, I, I missed to say that we do have three ways to give. You probably all know that. The black giving boxes, the app, and also the website. And then also today, today's Baptism Sunday. We're excited for that. There's people in this room that have already said, hey, I'm getting baptized today. Matt is going to finish and close out our Simple Kingdom series with this incredible text that Jesus brings to his disciples. And I'm, I'm excited for this. And if you're ready to be baptized, we'll have the logistics of getting to the, the black curtain on your way forward and, and how that whole process works. If you feel God just beating the heart rate out of your chest, please just respond to him. You won't regret it. And then also you get a free t-shirt. <laughs> hey, look, I'm just going to invite you, just like we have the past few Sundays, just to stand up, turn around, greet somebody, and here's the question. Do you like eggnog? <laughs> All right, take some time to meet somebody next to you.
Okay, what's the verdict? Do we like eggnog? We do. We like eggnog, okay. All right, no eggnog? All right. I'm an eggnog fan myself. I love it. Well, hey, welcome to East Point Christian Church. We're so glad to be with you today. The honor to close out our series on Simple Kingdom. We're coming into some exciting times. We've got Christmas about a week away. I hope everybody's got all their shopping done. You're ready to go. Uh, we have New Year's around the corner. Uh, uh, you may have, Keenan talked about this last week with his Ask, Seek, Knock message, but uh, I want to invite you in, in the new year, we're going to be as a church, just kind of leaning in the first three weeks of the year in a, in a season of prayer and fasting. And I just want to uh, invite each one of you to just consider how you may pursue God in an intentional way in the new year with us. We're really excited about that. We're gonna be sending out more information through email, through social media, as to what that could look like. It may be something that, that uh, is new to you, but we wanna invite you into that journey. So we're gonna equip you with some information about that. Ultimately, we wanna set our hearts to pursue God in this new year and see what he has in store in 2024. Amen, it's gonna be, be a good year, but we are wrapping up, I don't know, about 10, 12 weeks of this series, Simple Kingdom. And we preach in different sermon series here, and it just kind of helps us track along through different passages of Scripture or different topics. And we have been in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, following Jesus' probably most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount that he preached. And, you know, as we wrap up the series, what I want to do really quickly is I want to pull way back, pull way up. And look kind of at the meta narrative, if you will, the bigger picture. You know, Westerners, we always look at the small picture, make application. Hebrews always pulled way back. And, and Jesus, even as he was preaching this message, would have had the big picture in mind. And so if you, if you will, for just a second, go all the way back to Genesis. And think about Adam and Eve walking in perfection in the Garden of Eden that there was a kingdom that, that was happening there in the garden that was perfect. There was unfettered relationship with God. There was walking with God in the cool of the morning, hearing the footsteps of the heavenly father. Uh, I can't imagine what that must have been like, but it was, in essence, the way it was supposed to be. And of course, we know what happened. There's, there's sin that enters the world, and what happened with sin is broken relationship. And because the relationship is broken, now God has a new plan. He's going to send his son. And we see the prophecy of that in Genesis chapter 3, that he's going to send his son for what purpose? To renew right relationship with God, that we might again be able to come into the presence of God. To, if you will, establish again a new kingdom. Or to give the keys to the kingdom that should have been back to us. And so Jesus comes. And he stands on a hill in northern Israel near the Sea of Galilee, and he preaches a sermon. And we've gone through that sermon, and he starts off with the, the ways that you can live in blessing and happiness that, that don't sound very familiar to the ways of our culture. Blessed are the ones. Blessed are the ones. And he, he goes on, and he talks about being salt and light. This is how you're going to be the kingdom of God in the lives of other people. He, he goes... Uh, on to talk about fulfilling the law and our relationship to the rules. What are the rules of, of, of Scripture? And he, and he does something interesting that the teachers of his day were not doing. He says, hey, you've heard it said, all of these rules. But I say, actually, I'm going to bring it back to what's going on in your heart. I want to take it out of the realm of should and should not and into the realm of love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. What matters more, Jesus is teaching, is that, that our, the posture of our hearts in relationship to God and in relationship to other people. And he talks about murder and adultery and divorce and keeping our word. Jesus teaches crazy things like loving people that, that are our enemies and praying for those that persecute us. And we talked about giving to the needy, that, that the way of the kingdom is a way of generosity. The way of the kingdom is a way of prayer and fasting. And all through this sermon, Jesus is trying to establish, trying to teach us the kingdom is simple, but the kingdom is different than the kingdoms of this world. He teaches us about putting our treasure in heaven, not, not worrying. In fact, he says in, in a very familiar passage, seek first the kingdom 
And all these things will be added unto you. This is the the context of the sermon. I want to just get us in the frame of everything that's been said before I dive into the last thing that he says. He says, don't judge others. uh, Or or should I say, uh, listen to Graham's message on this. It was was phenomenal. But he teaches us what, what does it look like to walk in right relationship with others and not being judgmental, but actually dealing with our own issues first. And then last week we dove into asking, seeking, knocking, entering through the narrow gate that is Jesus. And we finished with, uh, with teaching on what, what false prophets to look out for. And so we enter in all of that context into the last thing that Jesus says in his sermon. And out of this, I see three questions that I want us to ask today. But here's what he says. He says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform miracles? Jesus said, I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Can I just tell you, this scripture terrified me for so long uh, because I would read it and I would think, well, wait, I, I've prophesied in his name. I, I've, I've prayed over people that were demonized and tried to cast out demons in his name. I've done these things. Maybe I'm not going to make the cut. Maybe I'm going to get there uh, in my imagination, kind of at the pearly gates, and they're going to be like, sorry, you're, you didn't make it. You're out, right? Has anybody else, be honest, if you've heard this passage a little bit, you're like, oh, man. And then there's preachers that will leverage it to sort of make you scared that if you don't do the right things, you're probably not going to get in, right? But again, pull back. Look at the context of who Jesus is. What is he saying in this passage? And he, he's, he's not talking so much about not doing the right things. But sometimes we read through our lens of how we see God. And we need to read through what he's actually saying. Here's what, here's what I believe this passage is saying in the light of the context. Jesus says, watch out for false prophets. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is worth listening to. And, and I think the primary question that he's asking here is, who are you following? I think the primary question is, who are you listening to? Not everyone who stands on a platform has something to say. Not everybody who has a microphone is worth following. Who are you following? And I would say that right now we have more options than ever. We have more opportunity than ever to listen to certain people, whether it be TED Talks and podcasts, news, uh, newscasters, opinion writers, TV preachers, Christian authors, politicians, social activists. I mean, everywhere you turn, somebody has a platform if they have a phone and they all have something to say. Jesus says, hey, who are you following? Who are you listening to? In 2 Peter chapter 2, this is Peter, who would have been sitting there on the hill listening to the Sermon on the Mount. And later he writes in his, in his letter, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who brought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Their condemnation has long been hanging over him, and their destruction has not been sleeping. It feels very dramatic. Peter is very dramatic. If you know anything about him, he's but he's he's painting this picture. And as I read it this week, I thought, well, okay, but how does that apply to us? Like, I don't think, I would imagine there's not a lot of people listening or in this room that are out there listening to, like, overt heresy. Like, just some doctrine of demons that's, you know, that's super overt. And then I thought about this. Who was Jesus talking to? Or, or let me say it this way. Who was he talking about? When he said false prophets, if you look at the context of the, of the Gospels, he was almost always talking about the Pharisees. Which is interesting because these were the guys that stood up and taught the scriptures in the synagogue. But he says, hey, watch out for the false teachers. Because why? Because they were leading people toward ritual void of relationship. 
And they were people that, although they spoke the truth, they did not live the truth. And Jesus called them whitewashed tombs. They were full of dead men's bones. Anybody that will lead us into a place of doing the right things without relationship with Jesus is leading us down the wrong path. It's not about what we do. It's about having relationship with God. Remember, the big picture of the kingdom is we all are longing for the kingdom to be restored on earth just as it is in heaven. There is something in our hearts that was written for Eden, and Eden is what we long for. And there will come a time, we know this, that he will restore all things, and all things will be made new. And until then, Jesus in his sermon is saying, but if you want to live the kingdom now, this is how you're going to do it. Be careful who you follow. I remember every year, I, I love New Year's. Uh, I love resolutions. I know many people are like, oh, that's, you know, I don't care about any of that. I love it. I love the freshness of January 1st. I love the anticipation of a new year being maybe better than the last one or growth that could happen, all the potential that exists. I love that. And so every year I sort of pray, Lord, what do you have for me this new year? What's What's something that's in store? And, and I remember probably, I don't know, four or five years ago, I was coming into this time of year, and I felt like the, that the Lord was speaking to me. I, I love to read. I love, to, I love leadership books and growth and all those things. And I, would, I sort of had a, you can ask my wife, I always have a pile of books. I'm a little ADD, so I can't just read one book at a time. I have to bounce between like five or six books. Anybody with me? Uh, I finished some of them. I don't finish all of them. Uh, but I finished some of them. And I'd just been through this kick of reading like any sort of like leadership type thing that I could get. And I felt like coming into the new year, what the Lord said to me was, Matt, I need you to take a break from all of those voices. And I need you to come back to my voice. And in the new year, I want you to set aside all those types of books. And I want you to double down on what you're re reading my word. He, he gave me some challenges in scripture to read uh, and to consume more of his voice than anybody else's voice. And here's the thing, none of those books were bad. R read them, they're, they're great. there's great things out there. But if the primary voices in our life are not the voice of number one of God or people leading us back into relationship with God, Jesus is saying, be careful who you follow. And then he goes on and he says in Matthew chapter seven, verse 24, therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down. The streams rose and the wind blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Another translation says, and great was the fall of it. Here's the question that I see in this. It comes out of the very beginning of that. What wisdom are you following? Jesus said, therefore, anyone who hears these, these words of mine, these words are the words to follow. It's like a man who builds his house on the rock. And, and I sort of picture Jesus describing these two kingdoms. He says, there's a kingdom over here that, that, man, if you'll listen to everything I've preached in this message and you'll build your life on this wisdom, this kingdom is firm and it will be established and it will be solid. But there is another kingdom. Make no mistake, there's another way of doing things. There's another wisdom of this world that if you follow that way and you follow that kingdom, there's a very different result for your life. And when I thought of this, I thought of Daniel. Many of you have heard the story of Daniel and the lion's den. That's kind of the famous story. Daniel gets thrown into the lion's den, spends the night. The lions don't kill him. But early in the book of Daniel, <laughs> we have the Israelites in captivity to the Babylonians. And in Daniel chapter one, we see that King Nebuchadnezzar is bringing the brightest and best of Israel to be trained in the ways of Babylon. Here's what it says in Daniel chapter one, verse three. And then the king ordered Asphanaz, the chief of his court officials, to bring, the king, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect 
handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. So, you know, a lot like me, right? Like, you know, every preacher that's ever preached this has done that joke, and I just appreciate the laughter. I thank you for that. That's good. <laughs> He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians, the language and the literature. And the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. And they were to be trained for three years. And after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen from Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You may know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from later in the book of Daniel. The king says, hey, I want you to bring me the brightest and best, and they're going to they're gonna be trained in this intentional school of enculturation in the literature and language and food of Babylon. This is the, the, the very definition of culture is what we read and, and, and what we listen to and what we eat that defines the culture. And, and here's the interesting thing. The king Nebuchadnezzar didn't care that Daniel continued to worship Yahweh. He didn't say, I want, I want you right now to unlearn everything you've learned about your God and learn ours. He was fine with that. He's like, hey, worship whoever you want. But in addition to that, what I want you to do is I want you to learn the language of Babylon. I want you to learn the literature of Babylon. I want you to eat the way we eat. I want you to dress the way we dress. You can keep God over here in the corner. That's fine. The enemy doesn't care so much if you continue to come into this place and lift your hands, so long as he can enculturate you into the wisdom of his kingdom. But remember, Jesus is saying, hey, that kingdom is gonna be built on a very different foundation. And here's what Daniel did in verse eight. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and the wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself that way. And after three years, the king brings them back. In in verse 17, three years has gone by. And it says, to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of the literature and the learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kind. And at the end of of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And so they entered the king's service in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them. He found them ten times better than all the magicians and the enchanters in the whole kingdom. This is just such an incredible picture, I think, of, of, of today. Because I think the big lie, I think the big lie that sometimes we can believe or sometimes that we're told is, Okay, yeah, yeah, I get the Beatitudes, I get all of those things, but, but I mean, in this world, we got to live a certain way in order to succeed, in order to have prosperity, in order to whatever, you fill in the blank of, yeah, Jesus' words and all that, I get that, but then there's real life over here. There's an intentional strategy from the enemy to get us to dismiss the words and ways of Jesus in an effort to follow the ways of the kingdoms of this world that we have to pay attention to. It's, it's just like Nebuchadnezzar. It was this intentional school. There is an intentional strategy to get us to follow a different wisdom. Watch what James says. James, who sat under the teachings of Jesus in, in chapter 3, verse 13, says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that come from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy, selfish ambition in your hearts, and do not boast about it or deny the truth, watch this. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. It's the first kind of wisdom. And then he says, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven, wisdom number two, is first of all pure and peace-loving and considerate and submissive and full of mercy and good fruit impartial and sincere peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. It sounds almost identical to what Jesus was teaching in the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. The very first message that we preached was through that first passage in Matthew 5. And James is just reiterating there is a wisdom that comes from Jesus that if you'll follow it leads to fruit in your life. And there's a wisdom of this world 
that is a wisdom from the, from the demonic powers of the world that wants you, what, to build your life on a foundation of sand because they are not for you. There's two types of wisdom. And I want to be careful here because sometimes what we do is, is we will we'll, we'll sort of say, well, I know who he's talking about. He's talking about this group of people over here. It's the progressives or it's the conservatives or it's the, you know, it's the right or it's the left. Or, no, no. Wrong kingdom. I want to pull up higher and help you understand there's a kingdom of, of wisdom that Jesus is establishing. And then there's this intentional thing that we got to push against. We got to, we got to, Keenan talked about it so well last week when he talked about the narrow way that we have to swim upstream against the wisdom of our day. And there's, in these two wisdoms, I, I sort of was thinking, okay, there, there's some prevailing things that we think. And I want to show you really quickly on the screens, and it's a little tongue in cheek, but bear with me. Blessed, this is the kingdom, the wisdom of the kingdom of this world. Blessed are the educated, the successful, the driven, the perfect, the good looking, the put together on the outside, for they have won at life, right? I mean, just go to social media. That's, that's, that's how you know you're successful. That's how you, that's the wisdom of our day. This is what you're after. But what does Jesus say? Actually, blessed are the poor in spirit, the spiritually poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for right standing with God, for they will be filled. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. That's not pie in the sky teaching. This is the words of our Savior saying, guys, there's a, a different way to operate. None of that stuff matters on the other side. What matters is that you're seeking God with all of your heart with all of your mind, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. There's another wisdom that says, blessed are those who are never uncomfortable for they have found happiness. I mean, the, the gospel of happiness is the gospel of America. That like, oh, if it makes you happy, then you need to do it. If it's easy, then it must be right. If it's uncomfortable, then it must be wrong. And then Jesus steps in and he says, actually blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of right standing with me, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Man, that's not a, <laughs> that's way less fun. That's way less promising, right? But Jesus is saying, in my kingdom, there's a different kind of wisdom. And maybe finally, it says, blessed are those that make a name for themselves, for they are self-sufficient, right? That's the goal. We just want to get to a place where we're totally independent, where we've made a name for ourselves. And Jesus is like, well, Actually, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. There's two types of wisdom. And the funny thing is, I think if we were just to pull back and look at, at the world around us, we would say there's a lot of things in disrepair. Man, there's a lot of things going wrong. There's a lot of fruit of the culture that we would say this is, Things are not going well, right? But yet we go there at, at, to, to drink from a fountain of wisdom that the fruit of that fountain is easy to see. And we would never do that in any other area. We wouldn't go to an unsuccessful businessman to ask him how to run our business, right? You wouldn't find a broke stock broker and be like, I'm looking to trade. And he's like, uh, I don't know what to do, right? Why, why wouldn't we do that? Because the fruit of their life doesn't necessitate wisdom. And so... I would just say to you, Jesus, as he's closing out, his message to them is saying, hey, there's two kinds of, of places to build your life, two kinds of wisdom, which will you follow, that, that the people you spend time with and the things you read and listen to will determine the course of your life. And then finally, he or the final question that I see here, and it's from verse 24 again. Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock, who puts them into practice. And the last question is, who will you follow? Who will you follow? Jesus doesn't give us the luxury of not making decision at the end of his message. Maybe another way to ask the question is, will you obey? Anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a man who builds his house on the rock. And when the storms come, his house stands firm. Will you obey? 
I don't know about you, but as I was writing this, every time I internally said the word obey, there was something in me that just wanted to push against it. Like, don't tell me what to do. Don't wait, obey. It reminded me, like as a parent, my kids are teenagers now, but it reminded me as a, as a parent when my kids were little, it was just like, just obey. I need you to obey. You can't run in the road. You're going to get hit by a car, right? And they're like a little helpless kid that just is being told to obey. What is that? What is the rebellion that lives on the inside of me that wants to push, wants to be my own kingdom ruler, wants to be my own Lord? There, there's something on the inside of us that pushes against the words of Jesus and, and says, I'll do it my way. Jesus says, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a man that builds his house on the rock. And I think it's really interesting. You know, this is the son of God, God, fully God, fully man, standing on a hill preaching a message. He could have easily ended his sermon by saying this. Everything that I've just said, just do it because I said so. Because I'm God and you're not and I need you to listen. He could have said that and he would have been right. Right? He could have said, because I told you so. Or he could have said, just, just listen to me. I'm God. He could have like, I don't know, turned a bush burning and been like, see that? Listen to me. I'm telling you. I got the power. Do what I say. He, here's actually what he says. He says, guys, there's all these things that I've said, if you'll build your life on this, when the rain comes, when the wind starts to blow, when the flood waters are coming up and it feels like they're getting above your neck, Jesus is like, I, I can't stop all those things from happening, but what I can give you is a foundation on which to build your life. And he's not just talking about salvation when we're dead and in heaven. He's saying here and now there's a way of the kingdom that if you'll build your life on it, if you'll just listen, if you'll follow me, it's gonna be difficult. It might be simple, but it's not easy. But if you'll build your life on this kingdom, when the storms come and when it gets hard and the wind is blowing and all you wanna do is quit, you will have a foundation that is rooted in me that will hold up and those that don't, great is the fall. They fall with a great crash and we've lived it and we've seen it and we know it's true. I'm in the middle of building a house. Back in August, uh, we were digging the foundation for my house and, and the land that I bought, it's mostly sand underneath the topsoil. If you guys remember this summer, all it did was rain. It just rained and rained and rained and rained. We had like a weak window or it wasn't gonna rain and so, my friend John, who was my excavator, came over and he dug the, dug the hole real quick and got the footings in. Footings are the concrete underneath the foundation. A couple days later, he set up the forms that you're going to pour the, the cement into to create the foundation for the house. And he's got the forms up. And uh, before he could get to pouring the foundation, it was supposed to rain the next day. And we're like, oh, man, hopefully it's not that bad. Well, it was bad. It was cats and dogs. I mean, it just poured and poured and poured. And all the sand on the sides of that, that thing, slid down and were sit, was sitting on top of the footings, maybe like a half an inch. It wasn't a ton, but there was sand underneath. And I said, John, can we, do we have to like, what do we do here? Can we just pour the, he said, oh no, you can't pour a foundation on any amount of sand because over time it'll just wash away and your house will fall over. Jesus is almost pleading with us. Don't let... Don't let any sand in. Don't build your life on, on what other things are happening in our culture. Don't build your life on what's going on around us. Build your life around these principles of my kingdom. And you'll be shocked at how strong your foundation is when things get tough. You'll be shocked at what you're able to, to walk through in life because life will bring stuff. Life brings hard things. Jesus says, build your life on me. And I wanna do a couple things right now as I close. I wanna invite some people that are here today and you're here because you've been, or you're listening because you've been sort of dancing on the fence between these two kingdoms. Not sure if you wanna fully commit, fully make Jesus Lord. I wanna invite you today. In Romans chapter 10, it says, if you confess with your mouth that, mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your hearts that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
the simplicity of the gospel is we believe that we needed a savior, that Jesus came, took our sin, died, was risen from the dead, seated at the right hand of God. And now we say, Jesus, you're Lord and I'm not. If you've never done that today, I'm gonna pause for like 30 seconds. And I just want you to consider in your heart and with your mouth saying, Jesus, I wanna make you Lord right now, right now. This isn't a bait and switch. I'm not gonna make you come forward or embarrass you in any way. This is between you and your heavenly father and the words you say in this prayer are not nearly as significant as the posture of your heart. Before God, you say, Jesus, I make you Lord. Just take a minute, wherever you are. I believe there's some people here today that prayed that or, or postured their heart toward Jesus as Lord for the very first time. And I just wanna say, I'm proud of you, proud of you. The Bible actually says that when one person repents and calls Jesus Lord, that heaven rejoices. There's like a party going on right now, if that's you. For the rest of us, we've not been shy about this. This is Baptism Sunday. Some of you are here and Maybe you have made that decision to follow Jesus as Lord, but you've never taken the step to be publicly baptized. Baptism at the core is our identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It's a public declaration of an inward reality. It's a step of obedience to say, I'm a follower of Jesus. The old is dead and buried, and there is new life as I come from the waters of baptism. And it's a glorious thing. It's a command of scripture. Many of you maybe were baptized or christened as a baby or a child. And here we, we believe in believer's baptism, that it's a, uh, we are baptized after our decision to follow Jesus ourselves. And if you're here and you've never been baptized, I just wanna tell you, we have everything you need. Maybe you just made that decision just now to follow Jesus. Uh, there's no like pre prerequisite courses for baptism. There's no, uh, in fact, there's a story in the book of Acts chapter eight where, where Philip was with an Ethiopian eunuch and, and he, he comes to the Ethiopian and he shares the gospel of Jesus and the, they're, they're going past this body of water and the Ethiopian says, is there any reason, there's some water right there, can't I be baptized? And he says, absolutely. And he goes and baptizes him right there. I don't want anything to hold you back. If today, like Kenan said earlier, if you feel that like, impression from the Holy Spirit. Your heart's beating fast. You're like, I think that's me. We've got shirts. We've got shorts. We've got towels. We've got warm water. There's water right there. What's to stop you from being baptized? And in a minute, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have everybody stand in just a second, and we'll take communion together. But when, when we stand, if you would like to be water baptized, I want you to sort of take that moment as an opportunity to make your way over. Uh, Fred is standing over in the corner. He's gonna wave his arms. Uh, uh, if you can see him, he's way over there. Uh, he doesn't bite or anything. He's great, love Fred. Uh, but, but he'll welcome you. He'll get you what you need. Uh, we have pastors out back. Keenan's about to jump in the tank. We're gonna go back into worship and we're gonna just baptize some people. And man, when they come up out of that water, I wanna hear the celebration of heaven in this room, amen. So here's what I'm gonna do. Uh, I want everybody to stand up right now. And as we stand, if you would like to be water baptized, go ahead and make your way over to the corner right now. If you're gonna remain in your seats, would you just take your communion elements? Jesus offered us a new way, a new kingdom. And it's a kingdom established by the body that was broken for us. It's a kingdom that, was, that ushered in a new covenant because of the blood that was shed to bring forgiveness of sins into our heart. And when we celebrate communion together, we sort of pull ourselves out of all the busyness of everything else that's going on in our world and we just remember a simple kingdom. It's just body and blood for you and for me. 
that we might live our lives on a foundation that is unmovable, unshakable. So take the bread together and thank him for his body that was broken. Thank you, Jesus. Through your body broken, we receive healing in our bodies. Through your body, we receive healing in our souls and in our spirits. Thank you, Jesus. Then we take the cup that represents his blood. We say thank you for the forgiveness of sins, that we are washed whiter than snow because of what you did on the cross. Let's drink together. Father, we come before you, and Lord, we want to be wise. We want to be wise servants that will listen to your words and put them into practice. It's difficult. God, we need the, the, the power of your Holy Spirit on a daily basis, on a minute-to-minute basis to walk out this kingdom on earth that you have established for us in heaven. And so today, God, I pray that every one of us in some area of our lives would make a move, that we would move toward you, listening to your words, following your commands in in these areas that you've laid out to us in your sermon. We praise you and we thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and enter into worship again.
baptizing people we got five or six more that are going to be baptized we want to be conscious of your yeah come on Woo! Amen. you know there's some things that just never get old and it never gets old to see people declaring the good news of the gospel that has changed their life from the inside out. Come on. So, hey, here's what we're going to do. I hope, I hope you'll stay, but we know you have some kids, and I'm sure our kids team would love it if you do have kids, if you went and got those kids. 
Uh, and so I'm going to close in prayer in just a second and dismiss you to go out. We're going to keep worshiping. We're going to keep baptizing people. So feel free to hang and stay. Two, two quick things. First, if you're new with us, I'd love to meet you. I'll be in Discover East Point uh, right after the service. Uh, next week, next Sunday is Christmas Eve. We want to invite you out Saturday night at 6 o'clock, Sunday at 3 p.m., and 5 p.m., which means if you show up at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m., you're going to be greeted by a, do- a sign on the door that says, come back at 3 or 5. Uh, we will not be having morning services, but we do hope you'll join us for a very special candlelight service uh, for our Christmas Eve services. We would love for you to come back. If you need prayer for any reason, our team's out on the turf. We would love to pray for you. Let me pray for all of us. Father, we just thank you so much that the gospel of your kingdom has so impacted the hearts and lives of each person here and those that are stepping into the waters of baptism, God, that, that our lives are being built in a totally different way on a foundation that is firm and established. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for us. We go out of here today rejoicing and celebrating that we've come out of the grave. We stand firmly with Jesus at the right hand of the throne of God. We praise you and thank you for what you're doing in this place in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed if you need to go. If not, worship with us. Let's baptize some more people. so much for being here being with here this morning being with us here this morning there you go i'm out of breath from all from glorious day what a great sunday we'll see you next week at christmas eve